final session here at this wonderful print seminar. The printmaking in the expanded field. Um, what do you think about the weather today? I had to take a shower at home before coming here. I don't know about you, but the other days we've been so generously poured down upon. So this is maybe for the better, okay? We think so. Uh, what we are talking about today, the main themes, will be like uh, printmakings, transgressive uh, possibilities, uh, print and design, what kind of dimensions are possible there. That's been lacking in the seminar so far, so I'm glad it's here today. And is printmaking experiencing a stealth renaissance? That's a question we're going to come into. So these are very interesting and very exciting themes, and I'm looking forward to listening and then debating. Okay, so I hope you join us. First, we have Margaret Miller, who is director of Graphic Studio and professor at the University of South Florida. Would you please uh, come up? And she's going to talk, her title of her speech is The Transgressive Mark. So, Margaret, <laughs> it's all yours. Okay, so go to the first one. I'm delighted to be here with you today and honored that Her Majesty could be here in the audience. Made me a little bit nervous, I must say. Um, I am also wish to thank Jan Pedersen for organizing this very informative seminar and Holger Kohlfud for moderating my particular panel. I am delighted to be joined on this panel by Andrew Rafferty and Sarah Suzuki, who will follow my remarks. Today I'm talking about production, a production studio, the making of art, the making of art in a collaborative environment. We've talked about the artists who make prints. Uh, today I want to also honor the printer artisan who collaborates with artists that come to work at our studio by invitation. What are the optimum conditions to encourage artists to use printmaking processes to experiment with new forms and concepts and make breakthroughs in their practice. Printmaking processes are acts of resistance by nature and certainly can be transgressive. In the United States, the university-based atelier is uniquely positioned to offer artists working in residence a broad array of technical processes and a collaborative environment that encourages a dialectical response to both contemporary conditions and the tools of printmaking. There are three major professional presses in the United States associated with universities. Tamarin Lithography Workshop was founded in 1960 in Los Angeles by June Wayne. A decade later, Tamarin moved to the University of New Mexico, where it is today and is recognized for its training of printmakers. Tandem Press was founded in 1987 by Bill Wege at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is now thriving under the direction of Paula Panchenko. Graphic Studio, founded in 1968 by Donald J. Saff at the University of South Florida in Tampa, is the, now the largest of the three university-based presses. Based on the scope of opportunities available to artists, uh, um, that is what is unique, being in a broad, uh, cosmopolitan, metropolitan-based university. Uh, we access scientists and researchers from across the campus. I serve as the fifth director of the studio, which is part of the Institute for Research in Art. And uh, that is the umbrella for Graphic Studio, the Contemporary Art Museum, and a public art program. It is the skilled artisan printmaker that inspires artists to make successful translations between modes of thought and material languages. The successful relationship between the artist and the artisan 
encourages and directs the exploration of the potential of various processes and systems of production to produce new work. Graphic Studio currently employs six printers and seven other support people and, and, a, and, and a sculpture fabricator that work under the auspices, the printers that is, of, of Tom Pruitt, pictured here, a Tamarin trained master printer and studio manager. It is the combined skills of the production team and the quality of productions that is the key to enticing artists to accept invitations to work in residence. Emerging and established artists are encouraged to expand their practice and use printmaking to make art that is experimental and transgressive. This has been the underlying mission since the inception of Graphic Studio. In 1972, Donald Saff began his first collaborations with Robert Rauschenberg. I'm going to talk about three artists that are part of the history of Graphic Studio and three more current projects. So Rauschenberg uh, started working at the studio in 1972, 1972 and subsequently established his studio and living quarters on Captiva Island in southwest Florida. <coughs> Bob's energy, authority, and excitement required an innovative and flexible environment. For example, his interest in chemically impregnating the fibers of paper with color led to experiments with blue printing and sepia printing. The dull, penetrating brown and blue tones produced by the sepia and blueprint processes evoke the greasy, soiled, worn appearance of the cardboard boxes in Made in Tampa 11, produced between 1972 and 73. The use of both the blueprint and the sepia print techniques in a single work created a particular challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. Because of the chemical antipathy of the two processes. The sepia section of each impression had to be printed first and allowed to completely dry. When the blueprint chemicals were applied, they had to be carefully hand brushed with the chemical solution. Rauschenberg's work at Graphic Studio challenged the traditional uniformity of an edition. Crops is a suite of five solvent transfer and screen print works from 1973. Bob laid out unique newspaper elements, <coughs> saturated them with solvents prior to printing. Then he stood over the press and dropped these saturated strips of newsprint onto the press and then printed them. Although the format was consistent for each impression in the edition, the details vary from print to print, creating an edition varié. In 1982, Rauschenberg traveled to China. After this trip, he worked with Graphic Studio to produce Chinese Summer Hall. A 100 foot long, 30 meters, color photograph. The photograph required the purchase of a Hasselblad camera and color processing equipment. Kodak, Kodak made the long paper, and several enlargers were set up in a former supermarket <coughs> to expose the collages of film cut from negatives of single photographs. Well, it sounds like it was really simple and easy, but it took us uh, almost a year to figure out exactly how to produce this 100 foot, 30 meter long color photograph. We only made three. It's an edition of three. Oops. Um, Rauschenberg worked with Graphic Studio from 1972 to 1987, and during that time he produced 23 print editions, photographic studies for Chinese Summer Hall, and the photograph itself, and four sculpture multiples that were part of the Rauschenberg Overseas Cultural Interchange, Rocky, which was directed by Donald Saff. <coughs> Rauschenberg isn't the only artist to set up a studio in Florida. After working at Graphic Studio, uh, James Rosenquist has worked repeatedly at the studio since 1971 and established a studio in Arapica, Florida, 
relatively close to the University of South Florida. He was one of the first artists to expand the scale of prints and produce multicolor lithographs, some incorporating photographic processes as well as three-dimensional elements. Mirage Morning from 1975 is a lithograph in an edition of 60, measuring 92 by 188 centimeters. <coughs> with the three-dimensional elements, with three-dimensional elements. For this project, Rosenquist used motifs found in many of his paintings and prints of the 1970s, including tire tracks, a carpenter's snap line, one of the tools of the trade that he used as a billboard painter. To create this print, the rim of a galvanized metal tub was coated with liquid tush and pressed against the lithographic plate. Carpenter's snap lines were used to form the square and triangle by dipping the string into the tush and snapping it against the plate to create the look of a chalk line. The track impressions generated horizontal waves of brilliant color across the surface of the print. <coughs> Painted window shades are permanently mounted to the plexiglass and can be drawn down over the images. The creation of the imprint, the trace of the mark, is the interstitial matter that forms the dialectical image. For Shriek, produced in 1986, Rosenquist employed his skills as a painter, producing colorful monoprint fields that have lithographic elements collaged to the surface. This allowed Jim to work at a scale, 107 by 181 centimeters, not possible even on a large lithography press. The classic nature versus culture dichotomy is evoked by the combination of the commercial image, or the, excuse me, the commercial image of the female smile combined with flower forms. Robert Maplethorpe came to Graphic Studio in 1985 and produced the studio's first photogravures. Delny Sacilato, then director of research at the studio, <clears throat> is often credited with the revival of photogravure. Irises, orchid, and hyacinth, three different prints, were produced from 1986 to 1987 and measure 120 by 104 centimeters. The photogravure process imparts an atmospheric quality through the subtle grain of the aquatint ground. Now, this, these additions were produced some on, directly on paper and some on silk collé, where uh, the paper was collaged first with silk and then the print was uh, produced. Uh, this created a soft illumination not attainable directly on the paper. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the market, but I think you might be interested to know this print sold out years ago, and we just got one back uh, from a collector for resale, and I called the Maplethorpe Foundation to see what the current price should be, and the ones on silk were $20,000 more than the ones directly on paper. I just thought that's a kind of interesting fact. So the price on these are now $65,000. We released them from the studio uh, to our subscribers for $500. Roy Lichtenstein's brushstroke figures were the first works to use the wax type process. This was another innovation of the graphic studio printer artisan. Uh, under Patrick Foy, uh, under Don Saff, Patrick Foy, the artisan printer, developed the wax type process. Um, Roy Lichtenstein was the first artist to embrace this new technique, and it was actually designed for him. So he created a series of brushstroke figures. Wax type is a screen printing process, but instead of ink, pigmented beeswax is squeegeed through a specially prepared steel screen. Once on the paper, the wax can be burned in with a torch and then buffed in a number of successive overlays that enhance the luminosity, translucency, and the t intensity of the color saturation. This suite of eight portraits made from 1987 to 1989 combine the wax type process with lith lithography and woodcut elements. Now to talk about 
three more current projects. Graphic Studio continues to be committed to a philosophy that provides artists with the freedom to, to experiment and pursue new directions with a broad array of materials and processes to advance their practice. While print editions are regarded as one of the most democratic forms of art production, as we've heard during this seminar, artists not invested in printmaking can appropriate techniques for qualities not available in other media, combining them with paintings and sculptures to produce unique works. Digital technologies have also extended choice and capacity, and artists working at Graphic Studio frequently combine digital with more traditional processes. Christian Markley has worked at Graphic Studio since 2006, often visiting two or three times a year. I really think we were his US uh, studio for, for, for those years. He lives in London. His visual practice is grounded in auditory themes. His body of work spans sculpture, video, photography, music, performance, collage, and now printmaking. He has produced additions and unique works at the studio using cyanotype, lithography, etching, and screen printing. Since the late 1990s, Markley's has created graphic scores, non-traditional forms of notation for improvisational interpretation by musicians and vocal performers. From 2009 to 2010, Christian Markley worked on Manga Scroll at Graphic Studio, an 18 meter, 60 feet hand scroll. Composed of collaged onomatopoeias sourced from manga comics. Markley's collages for Manga Scroll were composed both visually and sonic sonically and intended for vocal interpretation. Manga Scroll has been exhibited internationally and performed by different vocalists at the Whitney Museum of American Art during his solo summer exhibition a few years ago, at White Cube in London, at Gallery Koyanagi in Tokyo, and on our campus at the University of South Florida. Shelley Hirsch was the vocalist for that performance. Markley, while he was working on the Manga Scroll, worked on a series of unique cyanotypes. And this process of blueprinting, which you know from the 1840s, um, has been reinvented uh, uh, both chemically and in terms of applications by the Graphic Studio staff. So it's quite archival and stable. and doesn't fade like architectural blueprint drawings. And Markley immersed himself in the cyanotype a cyanotype process from 2008 to 2009. He first was interested in the work that Rauschenberg had done with the cyanotype process at Graphic Studio. And other artists have also embraced this medium, like Guillermo Quicca, Arturo Herrera, and even Alex Katz, each using the process in a very different way. But no other artist has pushed the parameters of scale or work so directly. Markley drew in a darkened room required to develop the cyanotype process. He drew with ribbons of cassette tape. You know what, remember some of you what cassette tape is? To create these layered compositions. I might add, we first tried it out on the loading dock and the wind blew everything around, so we had to develop it in our um, uh, acid room, a place where he could work. And so you see him here working. With this body of work, he reinvigorated two nearly forgotten media, the cyanotypes of the 1840s, as I've said, and the cassette tapes of the 1970s and 80s. Music cassette tapes were found in local thrift stores in Tampa, disassembled and used as the drawing material. Some prints used the plastic cases to form austere grids.
and other spools of unwound tape have been strewn over the surface of the paper in loops and twists, recalling Cy Twombly or Jackson Pollock. We made about 150 of these unique prints, and we also produced a book with uh, J.R.P. Rongier um, about documenting uh, the cyanotypes. Titles derived from the tapes used in making each image, like All Over, was the general title for this body of work, and then the subtitle, Dixie Chicks, Nat King Cole, and Others, which was the title on the tape. The resulting blue photograms reveal a silhouetted image that varies in darkness due to the opacity and layers of the tapes and cassettes. <coughs> the imprint actually conveys the presence of the body that made it, registering both duration and transience, presence and absence. It always reminded me watching him work of those films you see of Jackson Pollock uh, uh, painting over a, a, a and your, uh, the camera's under the glass. He moved about almost like a dancer, choreographing the structure of the print. The unique originals vary in size from 70, I hope these translations to centimeters are accurate. Remember, I don't think in that way, but are uh, from 70, 76 by 56 cent centimeters to 130 by 254 centimeters. And they've been acquired by leading museums around the world. And for me, I have to confess that that gives me a great deal of satisfaction when the work we do at the studio in collaborations with our artists is acquired by leading museums. And these were uh, purchased or acquired through donors uh, by the Brooklyn Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Guggenheim, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Uh, so walking into the Guggenheim and seeing four of Christian Markley's uh, cyanotypes produced a graphic studio on display uh, really uh, elevated my spirits. In 2013, Markley began working on a series of action prints that he produced by combining screen printing and hand painting. For this body of unique works, he focused on wet sounds like sploosh, uh, using onomatopoeias, again derived from comic books, which were scanned and digitally manipulated, then enlarged for screen printing. The works function ironically and reference pop art and abstract expressionism. Now I'm going to talk to you about a young artist that we just started working with a few years ago, Eva Gorgieva. I asked the question to her, and to you, why would a painter embrace printmaking? Eva is a painter. Eva Gorgieva is Bulgarian born and currently lives uh, in Los Angeles, and she responded to this question. And now I'll quote from her. Quote, printmaking has the capacity to involve two kinds of really human primordial things, the need to make the mark and a fascination with the alchemist processes that allows for a mark that can't be made in any other way. It's a different way of condensing time in the mark. Eva had not made prints until she worked at Graphic Studio. She recognizes that making prints could not happen alone and has successfully exploited the collaborative process. She gets every printer working in the studio uh, they love her, her energy when she comes into the studio, and there's a real magic uh, collaborative environment that develops. Gorgieva may, first came to Graphic Studio six years ago, producing printed editions and monoprints, often collaging printed uh, elements um, onto uh, her prints. In 2014, she introduced a new dimension to her practice with a series of unique sculptures with print elements. This idea came out of experiments cutting and collaging the surfaces of her paintings, exploring the shallow yet real space produced by the cut and glued edge. Taylor Pilat, a graphic studio sculpture fabricator, you see him on the left, found metal scraps to produce the bodies or armatures for the series of sculptures entitled Cosm. So the metal was sitting out behind the art department and uh, Eva and Taylor worked to pick out different scraps 
and then according to her instructions, uh, Taylor welded those armatures, those bodies, if you will, uh, that she then um, added her elements to. Eva worked with graphic studio printers to produce plates using a variety of techniques, including lithography, etching, soap ground, and cyanotype, generating the collage material that she layered onto epoxy clay attached to the metal structures. This epoxy clay you roll out like you're making lasagna or some kind of pastry, and for about 15 minutes you can kind of drape it at will um, over the structure, and then on that surface you can uh, glue your print elements. Uh, so she, she added print details, uh, she added painted details, so she went back in and painted elements, creating these unique objects. So each one is unique. The complex surfaces blur the line between the sculptural space and the perceived spaces produced by the printed and hand-painted marks. The migration of images extracted from her paintings to sculptural surfaces allow for a unique series of objects that are animated and live in their own invented world. As you would expect, Alan McCollum has taken a more conceptual approach to his pro projects at Graphic Studio. And just as a footnote, my first collaborative project with Alan was for, on the museum side of the house, and we shot rockets up into clouds and created triggered lightning strikes to produce fulgurites, which, we reprodu which, which are the fusion of the silica in the sand, and we produced 10,000 copies of the fulgurite that we created with the lightning strike for an installation in the Contemporary Art Museum. So, you can imagine the, the printers look at me with terror when I say Alan McCullum is coming to work. In 2004, he created Each and Every One of You, an arresting exploration of the emotional investment, investment we all share in giving each other names. In an interview with Paul Bernard, he said, and I quote, there is a fearful void in the gap between the names we are given and the presence we have with one another. I wanted to create a situation where one's life sort of flashed before one's eyes, a cacophony of all the people one has known, friends, enemies, lovers, happiness, and hurt. Hoping to evoke an avalanche of memory and feeling with the simplest of means, he researched the United States Census Bureau's uh, year, in the year 2000 compilation of the most common names and produced three portfolios, just three, of 1,200 prints in each portfolio, 600 of the most common female names and 600 of the most common male names. The prints were digitally produced, ordered according to popularity, so when you see them exhibited, it's to the order of their popularity, and presented in two handmade library boxes. When framed and installed, and framing is a whole other story, installed, they create, or installation is a whole other story, they in, uh, create an intense experience for the viewer that requires a simultaneous double perspective, whether you focus on the individual name or on the mass. McCollum's most recent project produced in 2014 and 2050 is entitled Lands of Shadow and Substance. Do you know the series, Twilight Zone? A uh, very famous uh, television program from 1959 to 1964. For this project, Allen viewed the original Twilight Zone episodes on his laptop computer capturing screenshots of scenes that included landscape paintings. So there you see the set from one of the uh, Twilight Zone episodes, and you can see on the wall there's a landscape painting, right? So that image was digitally extracted, edited, printed, and it was all about the framing with Alan and custom framed to create this series. Each of the 27 works in this series have been printed proportionally to its original televised incarnation, and in this edition of three. The frame prints function as dialectical objects. Their carefully chosen frames and mats add to their vagueness. Their existence is a form of poetic degradation. And lastly, uh, we invite artists from all over the world to work at Graphic Studio. I've mostly been talking about those based in, in the U.S. But 
we work quite extensively with Vic Muniz on a number of projects. And the one I'm going to tell you about, I don't think is the most important work that he did at Graphic Studio. But it's so fun that I thought I'd end with this. Uh, the original for Vic does not exist. For his suite of photogravures, and I apologize if this uh, is too risque for you all, uh, were finally completed in 2014. And the title of this suite is Lug Bugs. All right, now there's these really pesty bugs that are in central Florida, somewhat times up to parts of Georgia, and they uh, bloom and into these uh, uh, huge, um, uh, I don't know, blooms of these, of these pesty uh, bugs, and they get glued to your car, et cetera, and they're always copulating. Well, we were doing a project with Vic with skywriting and billboards, and he saw these, and he just thought they were so funny. So he conceived this project. So we had to capture these things. And you couldn't just drive down the highway because uh, you got all kinds of other insects. So we developed nets. We put out on our blog, please call us if you see a swarm of love bugs. And I deployed the staff to catch them. And we brought them back to the studio. And what did we do with them? We put them in a freezer. So they were really slowed down, but they were not smushed. You know, they were still whole. And then the staff, with tweezers, carefully placed the bugs in the outlines of these diagrams of figures in Kama Sutra positions. That's what they're doing. Here's what a car looks like, and there's what the love bugs look like. The designs with the frozen bugs were photographed, and the suite was produced as photogravures. My conclusion. <clears throat> Graphic Studio's nonprofit status and location on the campus of a metropolitan, research-oriented university allows artists to work without commercial pressures. That's not largely true because I have to say government funding is diminishing drastically and we only get 20% of our budget now from, from the university. Artists experiment with techniques often developed or refined by the collaborating printers, fabricators, and with faculty researchers across the campus. Uh, for example, note that Keith Ed Meyer's project is poured basalt. He wanted to work with lava. Leading artists are interested in working in the collaborative studio environment to make work that is investigative and matches technique to concept extending traditional methodologies of printmaking and sculpture fabrication into new realms of additioned and unique works. I like to think that we give artists an opportunity to do something that they cannot do in their studios or by themselves, that it is the collaborative environment that uh, is so enriching to their practice. More than 105 internationally recognized artists and some emerging artists have worked in residence at Graphic Studio and produced over 750 editions plus unique works. I have only had time to introduce you to a few projects. The Institute for Research and Art at the University of South Florida provides a mix of contemporary currency, historical overview, and scholarly, scholarly and theoretical authority, serving as a broad platform for the production and critical assessment of new and often transgressive art production. I like to think of us as a laboratory for the making of art. The Institute, uh, uh, that's it, right? The Institute of Retard, yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Let's just say it. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. That was an inspiring lecture co about core issues for this uh, seminar. And I'm looking forward to discuss this with you and our little group afterwards. Uh, next lecture is also touching the points of design, you know, um, printmaking and design, the printer. Andrew Stein Raftery, uh, would you please uh, come up? Yeah, we'll give him a big hand. <clears throat> now, I'd like to ask you, Andrew, how, what would you like me to say about you as an introduction? Well, um, everybody should know that I'm an engraver and um, that I'm a professor of printmaking at RISD where I've worked since 1991, Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. 
and um, I'm a national academician. And when I was elected, I was elected as a worker in the graphic arts. But they, we got rid of that nomination, unfortunately. <laughs> and the other thing I'm very happy about is that I am a member of Print Council of America, which is a group of print curators, um, conservators, and scholars. And I've recently joined the board, and it's an incredible organization. So. Well, thank you. You did this beautifully, so I just <laughs> leave you the audience. Well, so I, I have something, I have a question for you, too. Okay. Well, I'm I, I, the other thing I want the audience to know is that I, I am very committed to the whole idea of objects and yeah. um, you know, experiencing works of art in real life. And I brought something that I was hoping that we could pass around to the audience. It's um, on one of my pieces that I just pulled out of the kiln last week and oh. made it in Providence. So um, here it is in Oslo, where I'm so happy to be. Hands so, on. Hands I'll on, pass yes. It around. Thank you. It's just this. Hello, everyone. I am so honored to be here, and Jan, thank you so much for having me. So when I tell people that I'm an engraver, they always say to me, well, you must be the only person doing that. <laughs> and I start to say, no, I have friends in Germany and Japan, and they're great French engravers, and um, I teach all my students engraving. But that's not really answering the question, because the question is a little bit different. I mean, I think the real question is, why bother doing this technique that takes so long, that's been obsolete since the middle of the 19th century? You know, why do it? And I think that's a very important question. And not just about engraving, but it's a question that every artist who uses some of the time-honored techniques that have been active since the Renaissance to make work, we have to ask those questions, because otherwise the danger is that we could slip into a kind of preciousness, a kind of sentimental, historical thought. Um, and I think that's why I wanted to talk about engraving today and use my own experience as a kind of case study to answer that question. And in order to answer that question, I have to go back to the very beginning, because any of you who are students know that one of the most important experiences as you're learning is that certain things come across to you and you feel a special affinity for, and an inclination for a certain technique. And in 1980, I started at Boston University and found an extremely traditional art school in which um, in every class there was a naked person in the middle of the room and there was one way to do it and that's the way that the teacher told us to do it. But in our third year, we were actually allowed to take an elective in printmaking and I was so excited because that was the one classroom where there wasn't a naked person in the middle of the room. We could actually come up with our own ideas, and our professor, Sidney Hurwitz, was really committed to watching us work and thinking of things that might help us and showing us how to do things. And so one day, he came into the classroom with this tool and a piece of copper, and this tool is called a burin, and he said, Andrew, I think you might like to learn engraving, because he had watched me organize my lines and etching. And so he showed me how to sharpen the tool. He showed me how to cut the lines in the plate. And as I practiced this, I became very excited because it just seemed so natural to me. It was something that really satisfied my own inner need for this kind of very careful crafting of the object. But it also allowed me, and I'm showing you this very funny print I made in 1984 when I was a senior, it also allowed me to try out some of the things that I was learning in the life class about how to put a picture together and to really indulge in my own very um, kind of linear sensibility. And so engraving stayed with me um, f throughout those years, but also even when I was a graduate student in Yale. And I also did many other things, but I knew it was there as something that I would eventually turn to. Now, most people don't know that I used to be a painter. And this is a painting from 1996 that's very typical of the work that I was doing at that time. Um, it shows the Clinique counter at a fancy mall. And it shows two moments of time, two, the same moment of time, but with two different points of view. And we see this provocative glance um, between these two men. And I was very interested in sort of exploring the way that gay people and straight people interact 
in public spaces without us even knowing it. When you open up the doors, there's a triptych on the inside, and that interpersonal reaction has gone away, and the whole thing becomes about commerce and the final sale of the makeup and the exchange of the credit card. Now, even as I was working on this painting, I have to say that um, I was kind of worried because I felt the drive in this work was towards ever greater verisimilitude, ever greater realism, and that kind of smoothing out. And that didn't really interest me, and it really seemed like a kind of conservative impulse that would lead nowhere. And I knew I had to make, figure out how to make it clear that my images were actually constructed fictions. And I think that going more towards realism wasn't going to do that. My contemporaries, such as um, Lisa Euskavage or John Curran, who were at Yale right before me, or the Leipzig painters, I think they accomplished that, making that um, constructed fiction evident through distortion and the grotesque. But I'm very committed to this kind of surface of plausibility, this kind of reality that we recognize. I don't want to go to surrealism and I resisted breaking that layer of plausibility. And I have a quote from Gertrude Stein that actually describes what I'm thinking of. It's from the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas. So Gertrude Stein writes in um, Alice B. Toklas's voice, and here's Miss Toklas describing Miss Stein. She always says she dislikes the abnormal. It is so obvious. She says the normal is so much more simply complicated and interesting. So the solution came to me in 1998 um, with a print that I've been looking at since 1992, and it's the first old master print that I collected. Um, it's by Claude Milan. He's a French engraver working at Rome in this time. It's from 1630, and it had been hanging in my bedroom all that time. And when I think about works of art and close looking and living with works of art, and having the chance to experience a work of art over and over again, I really feel that looking at this print um, helped me to get to the next place. Because as I was falling asleep or waking up, the image was always so clear. And it wasn't just the image that was, that was clear, it was the marks that made up the image. And it's an engraving, and I said, I can do that. So, I had a set of drawings for another shopping narrative sitting around, and I reworked them to make them um, closer to the Claude Milon composition so that there would be um, the kind of size um, as in the Claude Milon composition. And I just started, um, transferred them to the plates and started these plates. And the subject of this narrative is a man shopping for a suit. And so you can see one space with two different moments of time. And you can see that I appear in the background with my partner, Ned. And it's very important that I've, I'm there because I'm a witness to the scene, but also like a narrator in a Jane Austen novel or Henry James, um, I'm an insider, and even though this is a satirical work, I'm also subject to the satire that's contained in this work. The triptych opens up, and we see the man being fitted for the suit. We see the girlfriend buying the tie, and then in the final scene, we see the man checking himself out in the dressing room. So the, the narrative is really all about looking at male bodies, um, touching them, evaluating them, but in the end, it's all about his vanity. And if you look at the shadow behind the man, you can see that it has a certain kind of cross-hatching in it. And the Claude Milan that hangs in my bedroom has cross-hatching. But as I began to research Claude Milan's work more, I learned that he had perfected a style of engraving that worked without outlines, without cross hatching, and even without dots to describe forms. So he really took away all these elements to create this incredibly simplified and beautiful language of form. And when we look into the details, it's almost hard to understand why we know that these are three men mounted on horses running in the smoke of battle. But it's there, we understand it, and that's what's the wonderful thing about this linear system. It's so simple, but it's also so abstract. And for me as an engraver, the other thing that's so exciting, and this is another reason of why engraving, is I can look at this detail and see where the tool entered the copper 
and exited the cover. I can see where he went in, and I can see, again, all those things. And I think the fact that the engraving has this kind of self-evident quality of its making gives a link to the past that I find very exciting. So after about three years, I finished the plates for suit shopping, and I published it in 2002. And I was in an entirely different world than I had been when I did that, um, those paintings. And I had to sort of step back and think about what I had learned um, from that work. So I started another project. And I think my goals with this project, um, which is called Open House, Five Engraved Scenes, was to see how far I could push those lines, how big they could be, how far apart they could be, because these are much larger prints. And also to see that if I could make a work that was entirely responsible to itself as a graphic work. Suit shopping had really origi originated as an idea for a painting. What it would be like to plan something entirely as a print. So I don't know how they do it here, but in the US, when you want to sell your house, you call up a real estate agent. He or she tells you to fix things up a little bit. Then one Sunday afternoon, you leave the house. The real estate agent puts up a little sign outside the door on the lawn. You see that up front. And then people come and look at the house. And it's fascinating to do that because you go and look at the house and you try to figure out who lives here. They're not there, but their stuff is there. And so that's really largely what this narrative is about. It's about figuring out the absent owners and then looking at the interactions between the characters who are coming in that are more incidental. And I think Margaret will laugh that um, there is the people who own this house actually have a Mablethorpe photogravure. And, um, but it's been rendered in engraving. So I think I did the first reproductive engraving of Mablethorpe. <laughs> you move from the living room into the dining room where you see their marvelous 80s decorative arts, and that tells you a little bit something about who they are. And if you look out the window at the right, you'll see the man um, with his hand on his hip talking to the man with the baby Bjorn. And in the next scene, we see those characters again. And what that is is the clue to this, the time frame in this narrative is simultaneous. So that looking down the hall, we see that woman who was coming in at first. We go to the upstairs hallway, where the main realtor is the woman standing at the top of the stairs with the clipboard. Um, this was before the real estate crisis. So um, maybe 2006 is when it hit us in Rhode Island. And so she's hoping for a bidding war. By the way, I, I, had, I pub finished this in, in October 2008, so it was just perfect. And the final scene takes you to the master bedroom, so we penetrated to the most intimate space. And there are many details along the way, but here we see the two pairs of men's shoes under the bench in front of the bed, and we realize that this is a household of a gay couple. But we also see that the man um, looking at the print over the bed is looking at the triptych from suit shopping. So once again, it's a narrative where I'm the narrator, but I'm also within this world. My process for developing this work involved building a scale model of the house, and um, that allowed me to actually see all the scenes in a simultaneous way. Um, I was able to um, draw, light the sculptures, um, draw them in wash nude, and this is a time-honored technique from Poussin and Jericho during the Raft of the Medusa. Um, then work up the clothing, and I actually bought almost all the clothing the and all the shoes that the people are wearing. I was very, I'm very much into that kind of research. And then finally working on the engraving, and I work through the layers of space. So I do the figures first, the foreground, the middle distance, and the background. And I worked on it for five or six years, and people always ask me if I get bored, but it's when I get to inventing these lines that all that um, preparatory work really gets to be worthwhile, and I start to really um, in, be very invested in that abstraction. So I'd like to show you um, my work in progress. So if you visited my studio in Providence, um, this is what you'd see. Um, I have some studies, I have these plates that I've been working on, um, I have some things from my own collection of historical plates by Claire Layton. But my project is actually bringing two very important parts of my life together. And one of them is an ornamental flower garden I work on at my mother's house. 
And so there's the front yard, but we see it from above here. And it's a very kind of Victorian garden. And there's a lot of annual plants that I grow from seeds, and everything's quite lined up. And I think it's also kind of an engraver's garden because of that kind of organization. But for me, it's also a great spiritual exercise because I'd like everything to be very organized, and then things go a little bit crazy. But my lettuce stays very organized. <laughs> The other thing that um, I'm drawing on is a collection that um, Ned and I have been working on for about 25 years, and it's of British transfer printed earthenware. Um, our period is from between 1810 to 1850, and we have about 1,500 pieces, so I think we might officially be under that category of hoarders. Um, and we live with it. We, eat off of it, we touch it all the time, I look at it all the time, I've never gotten tired of it. And I love it because it's a print collection to me. The images on these plates were made from engraving. And I've always wanted to do a project that involved bringing my engraving to the pottery. So, I've devised a project. Um, the subject is me working on my mother's garden in Providence over the 12 months of the year. Um, there are 12 different plate shapes that I've designed, and it's, I'm producing it in an edition of 100. And I've been working on that since about 2009, and I anticipate finishing it and having an exhibition next fall. Um, and I have no design background at all, but I work at a great design school, and I think I've learned from the ethos of the designers there that you just have to go for it and really kind of enjoy it and so I um, designed the plate shapes um, first with folded paper, uh, many of them referring to the historical plate shapes, but some of them just referring to the, um, the divisions of the things. And I'm not going to go into the technical part, because that would take an hour, but it's been incredibly exciting, but I'd like to acknowledge my incredible collaborators. So um, these three um, assistants, who one of them is a student at Wesley and the other two are at RISD, Nita Mukan, Sarah Wang, and Elisa Palau, helped me to make the models out of Sintra. This is my ceramics guru. Um, he's a professor, Larry Bush, at RISD, and he um, devised the clay and did the entire ceramics support. And you see Larry in his favorite place in the world, but I wish he could see the kilns here. I've, I've been emailing him about them. Here's his recipe, and he made the recipe for the clay with 180 clay tests, and he wanted to make a clay entirely out of American materials, but he also devised the production method, which uses these two-part dyes that are um, where the plaster is cured with air, and the plates are produced by an old-fashioned style of 3D printing on this hydraulic press called the ram press. And I loved doing this, because it was just like printing, and we made 1,800 pieces, and I, I have to say, I probably um, pressed 1,500 of them. This is our genius from Shanghai, Jack Yu, um, who was a grad student at RISD, and he's still helping me, but everybody's always trying to hire him away, and he perfected the glazing. Um, he really perfected the absolute temperature um, for firing the glazing. And I also have to mention your faculty member here, Paul Scott, who's really helped me to figure out how to get an engraving to stay on a piece of pottery. And we've had sort of this long-term conversation, um, exchanging details, and we had this exhibition in Providence this spring, but I think it's only the beginning of some great collaborations with Paul. And um, in the exhibition, I displayed the 12 plates um, on a wallpaper that I designed and printed in letterpress. And um, one of the plates is, is finished in this case, but this shows the 12 shapes. And as we worked on them, all of the shapes got names. And eventually, even though they're abstract, they had their associations in these profiles, and they became identified with a certain month. So that happened in the process, and that part was indeed collaborative. Of course, the most important part is designing the images, and that involved many studies from the garden, sitting outside, just getting a feeling for the atmosphere and the kind of places, and then devising the 12 scenes. So in January, I'm looking at seed catalogs in bed with old master engravings over the bed. Um, in February, I'm planting seeds in my kitchen. In March, I'm watering up my cold frame. In April, I'm digging out my beds. In May, I'm cultivating lettuce. 
In June, I'm training a passion vine. In July, I'm fertilizing. In August, I'm tying up a castor bean. In September, I'm mowing. In October, I'm bringing in chrysanthemums. In November, I'm digging dahlia tubers. And in December, I'm contemplating the garden in the snow. I made wax figures um, to study the various figures, and that really helps me to understand the body and then also to deal with the drapery so that it doesn't, the folds don't distract from the form underneath. And my final model for the print is this painted study. I painted it in flash, and it has everything I need to know. I trace the study, shrink it down, transfer it to the plate, and make the engraving. And this is the first engraving I did. And I thought it looked pretty good on a piece of paper. Um, but when I printed it onto the plate, it really felt um, too dense, a little bit constrained. And I knew that I had to rethink my process. So I went to my next painting, which is of me cultivating the lettuce. And here you can see my work area, um, where I have the painting, I have some sources for the lettuce, but I always work in the, or try to work in the presence of works of art. And I have these two works of art on my table. One is an engraving from 1932 by a brilliant um, French art deco engraver named Jean-Emile Laboureur. And this detail of the oak leaves in his engraving, Entomologist, it's called, is kind of my talisman, because he really describes the fullness of the tree without bothering to shade every leaf. I look at this print with my magnifiers all the time. And next to it is a print from 1573 by Cornelis Court. And I think the way that um, Court relates the outline and the shading is very powerful and um, was very, very helpful to me. So here in the detail of the mustard greens, you can see how I've incorporated Laboureur's technique. And in the figure, how I've incorporated some ideas from Cornelis Court. And when this print was printed onto the pottery, it had a kind of glow and openness, and there was a relationship between the image and the edge, which I think um, is something I really learned from. But then I also realized that the glaze, those lines in glaze that are fire on the pottery, have a very different quality than the ink on the paper. The ground of the, pot, of the pottery is so brilliant and bright, and really creates a kind of glow of light. And there's something slightly translucent about the blacks. And I realized that this really required me to adjust my engraving style. And so here's an example of the plate. And the plates for my older engravings used to look like holograms. But my new plates, I think, have the kind of sparkle of decorative metalwork. And even when I look at the, the details, I really, and as I'm working on the plates, what I'm thinking of is micro decoration. I'm thinking that each piece of the cross hatching and each ornamental, each mark has to be responsible to its ornamental purpose as decoration on this plate. And even in some of the architectural areas, one could see that the um, moldings could almost be taken off and used as kind of rickrack on sort of decorative types of things. And this is even held true in my back stamps, where I've explored. Um, what might be the potential ornaments for the borders, if I'd ever want to do that. The interesting thing about these prints is that on paper, they look unfinished. I would never publish a print where the sidewalk didn't fill out the circle somehow, or where that background area to the right isn't shaded. But it needs that openness to really exist on the pottery with the border acting as a frame. Now, to, I'm going to end with um, the most incredible experience that I think we very rarely allow ourselves to do, and that is to, to redo our own work. Um, so here on the left is the print that I thought didn't work out so well, and then I re-engraved that plate um, what, in light of what I had learned um, from this process, and I feel that the re-engraved plate does have more openness, more relationship, and more responsiveness to the decorative qualities of the um, required by the print. Here it is on paper, and here it is on the final plate. Now, I rewrote my ending um, a little bit because of things that I feel I've learned over the course of the seminar and in response to certain things. And 
um, I'd like to just sort of conclude by saying that, first of all, I do want all of you to know that I realize that this prolonged engagement with engraving has taken me to an extreme place. I know that. Um, and that's both in relation to contemporary culture and contemporary art. So if we're working in the fields, I'm way at the fringes there. Uh, but I have to admit, I do not feel embattled in this place. Um, I'm excited about it. I think I'm more of an explorer than a hermit, and um, that's a good thing. And I'm really eager, eager to go even further. I have more ideas about what to do with this. And I have to say that one of the things that's helped me on this, um, with this over the past 15 years um, since I first published Suit Shopping has been the incredible support of the print community. You know, that, that has uh, all across the board, whether at the print fair and museum curators and print council, um, print dealers, um, artists, the wonderful students and collectors, um, the people that I've met here, it's a really um, special thing, and I don't think every artistic category or um, discipline has that. And I really do appreciate it and I'm very grateful for it. And I do think it says something for our extended field, uh, or expanded field, that um, even, someone, I mean, even someone as extreme as me can be part of the whole thing. So I call my new project The Autobiography of a Garden, and that's partly um, in a tribute to Gertrude Stein, but mostly because you can learn almost everything you need to know about the garden, its inception, growth, climax, decline, and dormancy from looking at the 12 plates. But what about that middle-aged man who goes about making the garden with such determination? This project is satirical, like all my work. So it is okay to laugh at the genteel absurdity of his activities, his outfits that would not be out of place for a gardener in the same plot of land in the 1930s, um, but maybe not the sandals, and his ornamental flower garden, which certainly would have delighted a visitor from the 1840s. We do not learn very much about him, but he's seriously devoted to labor that makes beauty. To take this satire into critique, perhaps we could say he is an unrepented aesthete. So what really is at stake with this work? Stepping away from the character and back to myself, I see this work as a rejection of cultural homogenization, consumerism, degradation, and yes, I have to admit it, ugliness and vulgarity. It's an expression of my anger that as a person and a gay man, I live in a world that would reduce me to an object of marketing strategies. It is my utter rejection of the idea that a computer algorithm can know anything about me or my desires. And it shows my belief in the power of art to resist mediocrity and worse. And that is why I do engraving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That was just great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. That was just great and something we need for the seminar. Now, uh, we are preparing for our next speaker, Sarah Suzuki. Okay, you're right here. Okay. And uh, you are. Oh, come on. Hi. Hi, hi. Hi. We give her a big hand. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so, you are, you are uh, working at the Museum of Modern Art. You're associate cur uh, curator at the Department of Drawing and Prints. Yes. So, the audience is yours. All right. And you are mine for the next 25 minutes. Um, I just want to first reiterate my thanks to um, Jan for organizing this phenomenal couple of days. It's been really fantastic. And to my co-panelists this morning who've really given me a very tough act to follow. So thanks, guys. And I look forward to the conversation we'll have here um, afterwards. 
So to some, the contemporary print world seems to be cited on the periphery of the global art landscape, where we proponents of printmaking endlessly attempt to counter the misconception that a print is not an original work of art, or outline the differences between a print and a poster, or explain how an etching is made. Within some quarters, this state of affairs may contribute to the sense that the print world is somehow perennially on the verge of obsolescence, fighting for relevancy in a fast-paced, multifaceted, market-driven, international arena that seems to have neither time nor patience for a description of waterless lithography's merits. It's true that printed art has trajectories and histories that both align with and deviate from the arc of the history of art. And as print scholars, it's our responsibility to protect and preserve those specific legacies. But rather than seeing this as a moribund effort, I would argue that printmaking is currently experiencing something of a stealth renaissance, finding ways of insinuating itself into the larger activities of contemporary art without necessarily announcing itself as doing so. The conceptual concerns of these mediums and their things we've talked about at length over the last couple of days, collaboration, process, the idea of multiplicity, of copy and original, of reproduction, of sequence and seriality, these things are wholly present in work across disciplines, resulting in exciting new projects, both print and I'm using that term here to mean made and distributed within the realm of the print world, its publishers, printers, and dealers, and printed projects, incorporating tools or aspects of printmaking, but with a broader kind of non-print specific purview. Unquestionably, traditional printmaking, and by here I mean the production of additioned woodcuts and lithographs and screen prints and intaglios and digital prints, is alive and well. In New York, the annual IFPDA Fair, coming up next month, every November, has expanded to encompass not only a fair of nearly 100 international print dealers, but also a full print week of openings, exhibitions, and gallery talks around the city. And a revitalized EAB, or Artist Editions Book Fair, which you see on the bottom right there, in Chelsea, at which all the booths are devoted to contemporary prints, books, and multiples. And just last night in New York, the Art Book Fair opened at MoMA PS1. In just a couple of years, this has gone from a kind of fly by the seat of one's pants organization to a really sprawling event that takes over two and a half floors of an entire school building. So artists are really involved still in the production of prints, um, artist books, and zines. Artists who are considered among the great printmakers of our last decades continue to work in their preferred mediums. Bosolitz in linoleum cut and woodcut, Kiki Smith in intaglio, Jasper Johns in lithography. And I think the desire to brand these artists as printmakers in a way may be an effort to validate the continuing relevance of these centuries old techniques or also just the natural impulse of curators and art historians to want to categorize and classify to assign labels to things. But perhaps an even more compelling justification for printmaking is to consider how print-related but not print-specific activities feed back into many aspects of artist practices. The history of art, as we've seen, again, over the last couple of days, reveals many artists not necessarily identified as printmakers who incorporate print into their work. And just in recent memory, we have to start with Andy Warhol, who was really essential in embracing the porosity between mediums. In an introductory essay for the catalog resume of Warhol's prints, Arthur Danto enumerates what he calls Warhol's conceptual erasures. So, alighting the distinction between print and printed. The distinction between art object and usable object. The adoption of the Xerox machine, which is, of course, a means of making a reproduction as a means of making originals issuing editions that consisted, in fact, of unique variants, producing works at the same time with the same techniques, but classifying them variably as either prints or paintings. And the Cagney that you see on the screen here is one great example. In the first edition of the Warhol print resume, it was not included. It was considered at that time by Warhol to be a painting. In the subsequent edition, it was included as um, a screen print. 
Christopher Wool is an artist who follows in Warhol's path as someone whose work is suffused with the visual language, the technical processes, and the conceptual concerns of printmaking. It's present in the stencil-style lettering of his word paintings and the stamped repeating patterns of his wallpaper-like pictures, which you see on the right, with more recent works built of multiple printed and painted layers. Wool also uses print to create a sense of distance from the autographic mark, digitally manipulating painted strokes or transforming them into printed strata via photographic screens, introducing steps to make the artist's hand an instrument of mechanical reproduction. And as Warhol did, he allows for the accidents and the inherent vice of these mediums for screen print ink pressed unevenly through the warp and weft of reused screens becoming increasingly clogged he allows those accidents to dictate the final image and uses a medium designed for reproduction, screen print, in the creation of the singular image. But just as an aside, it's not exclusively in the creation of the singular image. In this recent series of works made at ULAE on Long Island, the additioned lithograph, which you see on the left, was translated into photogravure, scaled down, and then became the printed background layer for the unique monotype on the right. And the monotype is one of a series in which that um, printed background layer is used. This kind of approach can be seen with even greater prevalence among a current generation of artists for whom medium-specific assignations just don't hold that much significance. And this is something Susan talked about yesterday. For many, the techniques of printmaking, whether digital or lithographic, are naturally part of a larger palette of practice and they don't necessarily call their end results prints or addition them as such. Wade Guyton and Kelly Walker, who sometimes work collaboratively as Guyton Walker, connect back to Warhol's conceptual erasers, uh, erasures as they embrace the use of printed techniques and printed supports across their work, though often substituting the 21st century digital equivalent for Warhol's 60s era Xerox machine. Guyton's unique inkjets are printed on canvas or plywood using a typographic vocabulary of X's or U's that he grabs from Microsoft Word. While Walker's digital works are often accompanied by digital files that allow the image to be printed at any scale that the owner desires so that the duplication aspect of printmaking occurs after the work has left the artist's control. While these digital works rely on print, as do the artist's collaborative prints on magazine pages and advertisements, they're more likely to be positioned as paintings or drawings than as prints. This kind of malleability of medium is reflected in how the works are collected. At MoMA, works by Guyton and Walker using the exact same techniques have been designated as three separate classifications, as print, as drawing, and as sculpture. That's the sculpture that you see there. Rickrit Tirvenit's practice revolves around participation and experience through the creation of shared social spaces, collaborative activities, and perhaps most uniquely for him, shared meals. Beginning in the early 90s, his exhibitions and installations have often taken the form of communal kitchens or canteens where the artists and his collaborators cook meals with and for gallery visitors. But how do you experience Rickert's work if you don't happen to be in Argentina on the one day that he's grilling barbecue, or outside the Mesa plots at Art Basel where he was cooking this year? The answer has been constant, and that's the tangible product of Rickert's practice has been the ongoing production of additions and multiples that help to capture and even recreate the spirit of such events. The traveling edition, which you see here on the left, forms a kind of archive of some of these shared meals. It's a cookbook as catalog, accompanied by a chef's knife. Well, that's actually like a, a giant cleaver, and an apron. And each of the cleavers in the aprons was sourced individually. And the apron is then screen printed with a great phrase, and that is, letting things burn and cook and boil, that's great. And the edition invites us to be the creators of our own shared meals to, to regenerate these experiences, further spreading the artist's ideas. Just a couple of other examples. A 1993 multiple on the left comprised a recipe for pork sausage and a paper apron 
bearing a transferred image of a sausage, which of course you are meant to wear while you are preparing the sausage, which you then share with someone else. On the right, lunchbox from 1996 is a stacked stainless steel Tiffin box, and it comes to you empty, but with the instruction that once you acquire it, you should send it to a local Thai place, and they are to fill it with a specific menu. The menu is pork satay, green papaya salad, yellow chicken curry, and rice. It comes with a newspaper, so you can sit down and enjoy this lunch and read the newspaper as perhaps thousands of other, of, will in this case say Thai people, are doing at the exact same moment, creating this kind of resonance across time and geography. A recent residency at the Leroy Neiman Center for Print Studies at Columbia University in New York has resulted in a number of printed projects, and he's getting more interested now in more kind of traditional printmaking processes. One of them is this monumental three-part scroll, and it's this kind of visual autobiography unfurled over the course of these three sheets. And you can see this kind of purple spine that runs through the images. That's the artist's passport. Rickert is a Thai. He was born in Argentina. And he essentially spends his life on the road. So the passport is the size of a small telephone directory um, full of visas and amendments. And it becomes the, the kind of backbone for his own autobiography here. Printmaking-specific visual languages have also been absorbed across mediums, including in video and moving image projects, as is the case with the Japanese artist Tabaimo, often evoking great topics like violence, sex, death, discomfort, and delight. She draws on both the aesthetics of traditional 18th century Japanese ukiyo-e woodcuts and on the sometimes absurd narratives and blatant violence of another printed format and that's Japanese manga comics. Like her historical predecessors, Hokusai and um, Hiroshige, Tabayimo sets her work in the contemporary world, describing everyday life and pastimes with a characteristic perspectival flatness. She mimics the palettes of these masters by actually scanning ukiyo-e prints and then using Photoshop to capture and sample their colors to be able to reapply that palette to her own work. She also has embraced the traditional cast of characters from folklore, mythology, and erotica, depicting surreal ghosts, monsters, and hybrid creatures with a forthright approach to social and sexual mores. Men's Bathhouse depicts an amorous sumo embrace espied by this kind of phallic turtle in the background, um, inside the quotidian setting of the neighborhood sento, or bathhouse, with Hokusai's memorable depiction of Mount Fuji, in eruption now perhaps being read slightly differently, um, in the background. The work is, in essence, a printed still from, from one of her videos, but it looks and acts like an ukiyo-e woodcut. And only more recently has she begun to explore printed formats in earnest, working now in lithography, woodcut, and etching. The Shanghai-based artist Chu Anshang likewise works primarily in video, but found a really compelling conceptual reason to turn to traditional woodcut. His new classic of mountains and seas, an example of which you see on the left here, takes as its inspiration an ancient Chinese text of the same name, that dates from before the second century. And that source material comprised a taxonomic classification of flora, fauna, geography, accounts of foreign peoples, herbal medicine, but also as a repository for fables, for mythology, for ghost stories, a kind of compendium of information about the known world at the time. Chu's pages present modern technologies like aircraft carriers, like you see on the left, and genetically modified animals on the right, as though they were mythical creatures in a postmodern bestiary, though all of Chu's seeming impossibilities are actually fully grounded in reality. The choice of woodcut is paramount here. It allows him to maintain a conceptual proximity to the original, evoking its age with a technique that's been practiced in China for centuries, while emulating its style with elegant curving line work set against an unadorned white ground. Taken together, the images present a satirical and smartly humorous take on 
environmental degradation, social breakdown, and unchecked urbanization in contemporary society. That project also falls within a historical trajectory in which printmaking has been closely connected to social and political efforts. From the distribution of biblical imagery to a largely illiterate population of religious pilgrims, and the cautionary ballads and penny calaveras of Jose Guadalupe Posada, to the guerrilla screen prints of Atelier Populaire in 1968, prints have long been pressed into moralizing, agitational, or propagandistic roles. The political impulse continues in the contemporary moment, of course, with artists using the democratic reach of additioned projects to send their messages out into the world. The Uruguayan artist Luis Kamnitzer is perhaps best known for his groundbreaking work in the arenas of both conceptual and political art, in many instances through additioned work, which has been a constant for him since the 1950s. We have at MoMA in our files an undated typed signed letter, it's probably from about 1964 when he came to New York, in which he says, quote, I presume to be a revolutionary artist with a vision for the world and with the mission of implementing that. To eradicate the exploitation of man by man, to implement the equitable distribution of goods and tasks, to achieve a free, just, and classless society. In order for my mission to succeed, I have to try to communicate with the highest possible percentage of the public, something only possible with a great amount of production and a good system of distribution for my product. So he's clearly thinking about addition. And in his philosophy, the benefit of distributing additioned work that could reach many was clear. From dozens of sheets of printed stickers, like we see here on the left, an early mail art exhibition, to um, intaglios planned in editions of 50 that could m reach many sets of eyes rather than potentially just one. In a project currently on view at MoMA, Memorial takes that political impulse and brings it into the present. What Kamnitzer did was to create a series of nearly 200 digital prints, and they're essentially facsimiles of the 2001 Montevideo phone book. But what he did quite surreptitiously and without any kind of announcement on the page was to digitally reinsert the names of about 200 of the desaparecidos, the disappeared, who were victims of the Uruguayan dictatorship. And so in this way, he takes this document, which is kind of a, a public record, and by reinserting their names, returns them to the public record, puts them back into the history. And I, I asked him why it made sense for this to be an additioned project. And he said, because this is a public project. It's supposed to be a memorial, the way you might expect thousands of people to see memorial statuary in a public square. So for him, the only way to do that was to make it an addition. For the artist Nicolas Paris, the democratic possibilities of print dovetail with his pedagogical interests, which comprise a range of activities from teaching in a one-room schoolhouse in the Colombian countryside to organizing hands-on educational programs for children at the Venice Biennale. For Paris, a broadly distributable edition is a critical tool that can help people think more openly about the world and the possibilities that are there for them. Twofold is his seminal project to date. It's a flexible, interactive project that's taken many forms, but the most critical is an artist's book. And I'm just going to show you a little 90-second clip of that. So in each of the volume's pages, the simple act of folding over a corner reveals an alternate reality.
you can see with this incredibly simple gesture, a cloud can turn from placid to stormy. The letter D can become the letter B, a complete revolutionary shift with that most simple gesture. I, I love this little film because it has all of these different hands in it. There are men's hands, women's hands, children's hands. And I think it really um, speaks to the accessibility of this project, which was made in a large edition and was really inexpensive. Um, and just the way that it suggests all these myriad possibilities that exist in any situation and, and the fact that it's on us to try to kind of activate them. I also just love the idea of a, a movie trailer, but a trailer not for a film, but for a book. Oops, sorry. The artists that I've mentioned so far have all used print techniques to suit their conceptual, thematic, or formal purposes, regardless of whether they see themselves as printmakers or whether others do. While they might employ print in spite of print, there are others who engage in print for the sake of print. Matthew Brannon's artistic output revels in the not yet obsolete charms of letterpress. The look and style of printed retro ephemera, promotional materials, and posters informs his aesthetic, but he's opted to imbue both the form and the content with his own subversive twist. So these cheerful but sometimes misaligned images here, the ballerina, the syringe, and the hanger, are often paired with these carefully composed texts that have this kind of strange quality to them. This one, just an excerpt, undoing my seatbelt, loosening my tie, leaving the cockpit, pouring myself a drink. These also kind of undermine the ideas of reproduction that are of course inherent in printmaking as they exist solely as unique examples. Small intaglio plates and presses can easily be managed single-handedly, as demonstrated by the entirely self-printed oeuvre of Jose Antonio Suarez Londoño, whose etching practice of more than 30 years continues unabated in Medellin. Londoño works constantly on small plates. He often carries one around with him in his pocket, employing a nearly microscopically fine line in the creation of diaristic images that draw on art history, on archaeology, on music, on literature, on the cosmos, on the lyrics of Patti Smith, and the ballerinas of Degas. They're usually printed in just a few examples, subverting the reproducibility inherent here and selecting it instead for its singular artistic qualities and the artistic vocabulary that it provides. The omnipresence of Photoshop and other digital manipulation softwares and the affordability of high quality digital printers has given artists firsthand access to tools and materials in their own studios. These kinds of self-directed setups give artists the freedom to work at their own pace, in their own spaces, and without the pressures of a workshop staff waiting for deployment or concerns about trying to come up with a commercially viable image. For her major print project, Satin Operator, a series of 13 large-scale digital prints, and by large scale, they're five feet tall, five, so that's my height. There are 13 of them, quite big. The artist, Trisha Donnelly, coordinated the production of this small edition herself. Trisha's work can be really elusive for those of you that aren't familiar with it. It takes a lot of forms, from a slab of marble or just a snippet of sound to a photograph of a wave or an undocumented performance. Um, but what, what those things all have in common is that she, she's merging fact and fiction and asking us as viewers to entertain different possibilities about the overlap and continuum of time and space, asking us to allow for metaphysical ruptures and to accept the unexplained. This is at times very hard to swallow. But um, in the fall of 2006, she described this experience in which she stared at an image for so long that in her terms, it, quote, cracked, pixelated in links and shattered, creating a stutter of multiple images connected to the original. In this project, she offers the physical manifestation of that image stutter, creating an object in an edition of three that can exist in multiple places at the same time, seeming to defy physics, with imagery that seems to reverberate or shudder through her manipulation. You can see here she's using a found photograph of what looks to me like kind of a Hollywood film noir starlet 
rotating it in steps through the 13 plates. And as the back of the figure's head becomes a profile and then turns around in this kind of cinematic way to meet our gaze. You can see that underlying the image is this kind of cylindrical tube. I always imagine it to be made of cardboard. I don't know why. Wrapped in bubble wrap. And the support is also kind of stretched and pulled like taffy. And it's this double torquing that creates the visual stutter, that rupture and repeat in time and space that Donnelly has described. I think satin operator is perhaps in many ways emblematic of what's happening in printmaking now as Donnelly embraces digital technologies to manipulate her images, produces work that blurs the distinction between print, photograph, and in this case, installation, and is also self-produced and self-directed. Printmaking in the 21st century is perme permeated by the kind of porosity that we've talked about today work that simultaneously relies on and explodes tradition, that welcomes the incursion of other mediums and materials, and adopts traditional techniques into a larger practice to suit formal, technical, or conceptual concerns. We see both this embrace of tradition and an openness to expanding the boundaries, a desire to maintain and acknowledge print specificity, and to position it within a larger discussion that will keep printmaking central to contemporary art. Thank you very much. Just stay here. Thank you, Sarah. That was, uh, this is, was a splendid session. Imagining having the opening towards the printer, the professional printer in the studio, a homage to the persons we don't often see or see the name of even. And we had this extremist etcher in this extreme world that is so co uh, central to uh, this seminar. And we also had Sarah Suzuki, who is uh, in the middle of the, also the printed, um, expanded field, really expanded. So I'm really looking forward to what we're going to talk about now. So please come up and we'll sit over here. We'll arrange a little bit and then we'll start. So. I was saying, I think Andrew and I have the most despair, height disparity of any panel, probably. Well, it's like a silent movie scene. Like that. That's okay. All right. Now, uh, sometimes you're very lucky being a moderator, you know, when you have people like you. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very central to uh, the theme of this seminar is, of course, the collective workshop. And I think we maybe should start there. Uh, you know, all those professional people working for the artists, or who are themselves artists and printers, you know? Uh, so, what are kind of the moral guidelines here? How often do, as you very beautifully explained, the collaborative dimension of the works of art? I mean, these artists who are famous in their own right, coming to a workshop like you have, they will develop something that they couldn't have dreamt up themselves, you know? This is something new. That is a combination of knowledge and experience, etc. So... Well, may I say that it doesn't always work out. <laughs> um, no, luckily. Uh, and on many levels, um, not always is our studio and our <coughs> printers going to mesh perfectly in a create a magical kind of collaborative yeah. uh, situation. Um, artists come in when they first uh, visit. We spend probably a day, a day and a half, um, 
looking at work that's been produced at the studio by other artists. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep a complete archive of everything that we have produced. Yeah. And that's a very important first experience. And then the artist presents their work to the staff and over lunch. Every day I buy lunch when an artist is in residence and every day the printers and the artists and the rest of the staff eat with the artist, uh, take them on visits, in case of Christian Markley, out to find cassette tapes at thrift stores. Uh, and so there develops a rapport between the artists and they experiment in a lot of different directions, and sometimes it just doesn't work out. Okay. Something is not, uh, isn't realized, and we don't move forward with it. Or in some cases, they start something, and it can't, we can't quite figure out what direction we're gonna go, and they may come back to it a year later, or uh, Allison Schatz started a whole body of work with us, and abandoned it, and then called me up three mm. years later and wanted to move forward. Is it always the artist who has the final decision of if it's going to be done or not? Well, no. Uh, you know, I, 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 I stay out of the studio. I'm not a printer. I'm not an artist. I come in two or three times a day. I usually take the artist out to dinner and chat about the project. And I have to confess that there is a moment when I have to be a realist and say, this is just not the best work from the artist that we're going to move forward with. I remember at a seminar once, Red Groom said, you know, if you're going to make a print, it really be, it ought to be something really wonderful because you're going to make more than one of them. <laughs> so don't make something that's bad. And so I think uh, okay. th there well. is an assessment, and it's obviously between us, and mm -hmm. I have to make a decision also in terms of cost of production versus market. Yeah. Then we're coming to my first question. And that is, uh, there are different traditions in Europe and probably in the United States as well about uh, is the professional printer in these types of collaboration, is his or her signature on the print? No, but there's a chop mark for okay. the studio and sometimes the chop of the individual printer that's part of the process. We copyright each one. Uh, we do a full documentation sheet that accompanies every project that outlines every single person from the accountant to the editor okay. to the curator that's involved in the project. And it also spells out exactly the materials that are used. So mm -hmm. when a Liechtenstein wax type comes back into the studio because somebody left it in the frame on a tarmac on, as they were shipping it, uh, we know exactly what were the materials that were used that we mm. can maybe sometimes help with the conservation of the work. So, um, Okay. Uh, maybe there are different opinions about, you know, or ideas about this theme in a way because it's rather central. I mean, the history of graphic art, you have different traditions, you know, the, the delineavit, the d drawer, or the pinksit, the painter who's made the painting or the drawing. And then you have the fake it, you know, the guy who's uh, made the graphic part of it. And, you know, they're di they have different, they are classified differently. Well, artists but work in many different ways. Yes, okay. Some draw directly on the plate, some draw on <coughs> mylar that's transferred photographically. Yeah. Um, some work uh, with Photoshop and digital and produce a film that then the printers create the etching plate. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can vary. Yeah. Uh, Jia Ali, when he came from China, he didn't want any f digital interface. He just wanted to draw directly on the plate, and that's what he did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, opinions about this question in the audience here? Young people, for instance, what do you think? Here's one. Yeah? If you have questions you don't want to say in English, please say it in Norwegian, and I'll translate. I'll try to. Oh, it is on, sorry. <laughs> my name is Gabrielle Perry. I am a first year MA student, and my question is for Margaret. Um, I was just wondering, in what, uh, how much freedom does the printer have in this collaboration with the artist to make artistic or creative suggestions? Uh, or are how they just there how in how a technical... How much power does the pr printer have? Exactly. How much input? Y yeah. Well, often it's the printer that uh, comes up with a technique or a way of pursuing the idea. So it's, it's a kind of back and forth between the printer and the artist. And often 
the printer will introduce, like for instance to Eva, she'd never made a soap ground, a lithograph, or an intaglio. So they spent several days just showing her what the results would be of those different techniques and looked at her drawings and make a suggestion of maybe how to solve a problem. We're often about solving problems. Mm. Thanks. So, um, I mean, that was the same experience I had with my ceramics friend, Larry, in that I certainly couldn't have done any of it without him. Oh. And so he, I, I showed him samples of the kind of feeling that I wanted it to have, and he was able to get closer, but he knew exactly which clay was going to be um, yeah. stiff enough to go through that machine, um, what was not going to shrink too much. Those are things I never could have known. But then, I have to say, because he's my friend, he one time gave me a hint. And he was the one who told me that that engraving really didn't look very good on that plate. <laughs> and, all he, and all he said, don't you think that's a little bit much, Andrew? <laughs> and I think one of the things that happens, I, I know that it's harder to do in, in your situation, but one of the things that happens so rarely for an artist is actually to have somebody give you a serious chest nugget that you can work with. <laughs> you know, mm. and I think um, it had to be that frank about things. You yeah. know, in the afternoon after we've proofed, uh, often we'll pin up uh, the proofs and the printers and I come into the room and we look at the work and we discuss it. And we'll make suggestions about what the next proofing uh, might entail or what a new technique might be. You know, in some cases we start out working on an image in one technique and end up using something else. Um, what we're working for is a moment when we all agree that, that, that we have absolutely what we're going to audition and you all know that then the artist signs ATP, approval to print or BAT, and that is the model by which the edition is produced and the artist may leave and the printers may work three or four months uh, producing the edition and the artist comes back. The curator then looks at each uh, print, each impression, and compares it to that BAT and throws the one away that don't meet the standard that was agreed upon when that BAT or that ATP was mm -hmm. signed. I recently heard just a really great workshop story, if I may share. Um, I don't know if people are familiar with the artist Do Ho Sa, a Korean artist who works with textile, really beautiful sculptor. And he was at Singapore Tyler Print Institute in Singapore, and he was trying to make these big additioned drawings of thread embedded in paper pulp. And kind of like Graphic Studio, this is a laboratory. They've probably looked very closely at a lot of things that you're doing. They'll try anything. And they spent weeks trying to figure out how to embed this beautiful colored thread into this wet pulp. And finally, after three weeks, a summer intern, a young woman who was a fashion design student, said to them, you know, I, I don't want to butt in, but I'm just wondering why aren't you using this gelatin-backed thread that we use in fashion design? And they said, well, because we didn't know that existed. <laughs> and that was the solution for that project, and it's a technique that he's continued mm -hmm. to use in the last year and a half, that specific material. Um, but as he said to me, it's something he never would have discovered if he hadn't been in this kind of collaborative situation. Mm. So. And, and, and I'm just thinking, we're working with uh, Tomas Saraceno currently, and he wanted us to work with thermal inks, which we've experimented with. And so we, we, we test them, and we put them out in the light, and we see how, uh, how they're going to work, and they don't work. I mean, they, they're, they're gone in, in uh, a month or six weeks. And Saraceno says, I don't care. I want to do it anyway. Mm. And I say, no, I can't, I can't let that leave yeah. the studio. Hmm. So, you know, it's a give and take, and not all things are possible, but I look forward to those students and their suggestions. Mm -hmm. They often come up with great ideas about how to solve a problem. Okay. Has it ever happened that an artist has given some good ideas to a printmaker, and then he's making the print afterwards <laughs> for himself and signing it? Oh, I'm sure. You're sure? I don't know But you don't have it documented? No. no? Okay, well, we'll be waiting for that day because <laughs> that's partly what this seminar is about, you know, the relevance of the 
printer, the printmaking process mm -hmm. and everything. Okay, are there other questions on this? Sure, would you come with? Yes. Oh, you got uh, it, sorry. Marius Johnson, uh, student in printing department. Um, you ma Margaret mentioned it shortly, but um, the last week we've seen a lot of work that it has a fairly low uh, number of editions. Yes. Um, in, now that we move on to a new era of printmaking, is the edition irrelevant or? Uh, I think the edition is very relevant still. And while I picked watershed projects that often, uh, and some were unique, I still strongly believe that uh, the edition is absolutely appropriate for uh, certain projects. Um, we don't usually make more than 30, 50 sort of our max. I say that, and then with Ed Ruscha, we just did this four-edge book, and it's 250. So there are certainly exceptions. Uh, okay. Uh, other questions from the, the wonderful group here today? Uh, hi. Okay, there you go. Uh, say your hi. name. Uh, Martin Kolsru, yeah, I am a student. I have a question for Andrew. Um, because you started your presentation by saying, uh, um, why, um, why do you do it? Or uh, the old technique? Yeah. Because I've also been like, um, often confronted with the question why, why do you do it? I uh, conclude with that um, uh, I really like the things like uh, makes me do art. So is it necessary to to question this, like, uh, this love for what you do? I think it is necessary to ask the question because um, I think if printmaking, and especially certain kinds of printmaking, is going to stay alive and not just be a kind of demonstration or re-performance of the past. We have to really figure out, and it's not always, I think just asking the question doesn't mean that we necessarily are going to have a definitive answer because we're talking about art. But I think really making sure we ask that question um, is, is, has to be done. I'm going to teach um, um, an elective in engraving next spring with my students. And I know that that's going to be part of what our discussion is going to be, along with the technique, to really think about why, we, you know, why any particular person would choose to do these things. And mm. I'm very, you know, I, I think about artists who do mezzotint. Um, I think even about, the, you know, I think Sarah touched on the letterpress revival. And no, I mean, when I was in grad school, there were so many letterpresses being thrown away. Yeah. Who would have thought that there would be such a compelling reason to do letterpress again? So um, the other thing I think is, is about printmaking is it is a repository for um, reviving the obsolete. So once graphic design gets rid of the equipment, um, you know, Printed Matter was talking about the risograph. And I remember going to the editions fair and seeing some of my former students so excited that they just done this thing with the risograph. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it, it's interesting to see how um, at different times things become compelling. Mm. Were you satisfied with the answer? Yes? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, would somebody go with a microphone there, please? Say, state your name first, please. Hello, I'm Nina Beckman. Thanks for a great morning. Uh, I have another question for Margaret about editions. You say you think they are relevant. I just would like you to hear you elaborate a bit more on why you think they're relevant. Well, for example, there are uh, the Christian Markley action prints that I showed you. Now, we're spending a great deal of time out on the loading dock where he's painting the backgrounds for those, and then we're, we, we actually make a model that he can look <coughs> at as he's making his marks. And then we screen print over that, sometimes multiple times. That You cannot addition that. It's unique because of the monoprint or the painting, painted background. Uh, other times we've made etchings, and actually sometimes he's um, hand-painted uh, a model, and then we've reproduced that uh, uh, in, in, in a print medium, and we can addition it. So I think... Uh, just to give people broader access to Christian Markley's work, I think it's important to do additions. For example, 
I, I don't want to get too far into the market. Do you find that vulgar to talk about the market? I think some of you do. But uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the smaller prints of Christian Markley, you can buy for $1,500, $2,000. Okay, that action print, those are on the market at $75,000 which I might tell you helps the studio tremendously to move forward with other research <laughs> projects. So I like things that, that, that can uh, do well in the market. Of course, we're getting a fraction of the list price. Only 20% of the list price comes back to the studio. And our model, by the way, is we pay all the expenses of the artists in residence, uh, all of their travel, their, their, their housing while they're there, all of the materials uh, for their work, uh, they're there for usually a week at a time to 10 days. And then we put it into the market and we go to the art fairs. We participate in, in the IFPDA print fair that you saw in Sarah's, um, and we give the artist 50% of receipts. So obviously, we're offering multiples, uh, uh, multiple originals um, in the market. And I think uh, the other dealers buy them and, and collectors buy them. So it just gives more access to the work. So I think it's very important for that reason to do additions. Now, cause I, uh, thanks a lot. Now, because I was also curious if you think there are circumstances where uh, you say you do often pretty small additions, but in maybe some projects it might be relevant to not have it sort of numbered or even signed. I'm thinking of Sister Corita Kent. Are you asking me, do I think sometimes there should be open editions? Yeah. Well, we did some wallpaper with Trenton Doyle <laughs> Hancock that was a completely open edition. And I had to actually reprint three times. It was so popular. It's a 3D, with the 3D glasses, it, it has a three-dimensional effect. And it was bought uh, by institutions as well as individuals. And I think there the concept fit with the idea of an open edition. On the other hand, there's a tremendous cost associated with making large editions that are hand printed. And so they, you tend to uh, reduce the number. Also, the fewer there are, the better the price. OK. Uh, shall we continue then if there are no more? OK, one more here. Uh, yes, my name is Theodore Bart. I work here. Um, I was kind of um, caught by uh, some the idea of your work, Margaret, as a kind of parallel production to the artistic uh, work that takes place in in in, this, in the workshop, uh, and also while while you were talking, um, I was ensnared actually by your talk. You started out with. Uh, Rauschenberg, then we get Rosenquist, Robert, Mapplethorpe, Roy, Liechtenstein, all these R's, you know, like in theory you would have Bourdieu, Baudrillard, Barthes, etc. But here we had a bunch of R's. And then we went over to Tim Baker, Bert Barr. We go to C's, the cyanotypes. Christian Markley, manga comics. Uh, 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 Christian Mar Markley makes cyanotypes. By, uh, by that time, it ha they had become cyanotapes in my mind. And uh, this kind of synesthesia that is really, really quite effective in terms of make creating an imprint through language and image. I'm just wondering, as a, when you work in your workshop, do you occasionally have to act as a snake charmer? You know, that in some sense that the suggestions that you make are very, very skillfully made and that this is part of a profession. And when you come to the chip, I start thinking about the signature in the sense of uh, Giorgio Agamben, uh, who has been, uh, had this idea that the signature is a sign within the sign and, one, and he compares it to the lute. Uh, when you start playing the lute, then the entire work is revealed. Uh, but in a different way. Um, it, w um, I, I guess my question to you is, is um, uh, this coexistence of signatures at, 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 as at two levels of the work, to, tailing on to what, what I think uh, Holger has been driving at, does that kind of make sense? Or? Well, I think it goes back to, to the collaborative studio. This is a very... Uh, when, when, when do the collaborative studios really start? In the, in the, in the state? Yeah, like in the late 50s. Late 50s. Late 50s, and we have this renaissance of printmaking 
in the United States, and I started out with that with women like June Wayne and Titania Grossman, uh, who founded ULAE, and they really established this notion of this, this collaborative studio in which the printmaker artisan, and I have to say the director too, uh, create this environment. You know, there is a curatorial process that I'm engaged in, in terms of the artists that are invited to come to the studio. And I, th and I hoped you could see there wasn't a single style or a particular kind of, of, of practice that interests me, but try to bring a broad array of projects. And the other is, this is on a university campus. I care a great deal about how the artists that we bring in are meaningful to the students that we have on the campus. And the studio is open for students to come in, not to work, although we solve a lot of problems for them, uh, <laughs> gladly, the technicians, but to meet the artists and engage in a discussion with them. And then, remember, I'm also the director of the museum, so I try to put the artwork into some historical or contemporary context, not necessarily the work that's produced at the studio, but the work by those artists. That, as, as a matter of fact, I did a show called Audio Files with sound artists, and that was the first meeting with Christian Markley, who then said, I have this project I'd like to do at Graphic Studio. And that's how we started a relationship with him in 2006, but it actually started with an exhibition. So it's this whole environment that's collaborative, you know, from the curator to the, art, to the uh, artisan, uh, that all makes this um, environment where artists can be experimental and productive, and I hope transgressive. Uh, okay, then I think we should go on to some another topic that is very central to the seminar, and especially with uh, you wonderful people here, and that is the topic of crafts. Now, to my to my mind, uh, after the Documenta 13, you know. I think the, the grip, the total grip of the, so we say, conceptual way of thinking has been a little bit slacked off. So there were other trends, other things where, you know, the, the, the making, the media, again, was in focus. And as you've shown in your, uh, in your uh, lectures today, there are lots of people working very with materials in different ways, etc. So are we going back to uh, maybe another way of thinking? Now, if you take this seminar seriously, uh, excuse me, this is a bit a consumeristic way of thinking, but if you listen to the applause, there were two great applause for the whole seminar. I mean, everything was good. Andrew, he got number one. And we had Nina Bundeson, are you here? She was, yeah, she was number two. If you'd uh, s listen to the sound and the length and the intensity, one, two, and the rest was number three. So you're okay, all right. <laughs> so the, the idea is that maybe uh, people are responding <coughs> towards this way of thinking. That's my idea and my questioning. Have you noticed, Sarah, for instance, and, and you also, Andrew, and, and your way of where you work, that there is a renewed interest in the hand-on kind of thinking and working? Um, I'm not sure I would say that that ever went away. I, I think that if you look at the covers of Art Forum, you might think that there was only a conceptual mode of production, yeah. that people mm. weren't thinking about making or the hand. But when you talk to artists and you look really broadly at what's happening, I think making has always been an important part of the conversation. Mm. Also in the theoretical field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. I mean, I think there, there, what's funny is in our effort to constantly rediscover, and this is something that I think happens, there is this kind of, I see like a fetishization of the 1960s that I hope is finally coming to an end. <laughs> I don't know if people agree with me, but like enough already. But a constant need to go back and rediscover. And it's for lots of reasons. The scarcity of material, the market demands, new fodder. Um, and so I, you, you do start to see figures being brought into the conversation who were formerly excluded and pushed to the margins. I'm thinking of someone like 
Marina Lena Mukherjee, who's, uh, she died last year, sadly, an Indian um, sculptor who worked primarily with hemp. And for a long time, she was discussed as a textile artist, not as a sculptor, and that was a craft-based um, a craft-based activity. There's a lot of other things get, that get built into that, a whole neo-colonialist discourse as an artist in Delhi who was being shown in Bristol and London, but now she's really, the work is being understood as sculpture. So I think it's coming perhaps more to the critical fore and the theoretical fore as people go back and need to rediscover to bring new material into, these, into dialogue, but I don't think it ever actually left. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Andrew, what, what is your uh, opinion on these questions? Have I you have noticed? a couple of thoughts. I mean, one, one thought, of course, is that no matter how perfect the graphic studio prints look, they're so unbelievably crafted. And those pieces of paper have been touched so many times <laughs> to get to that thing. You know, that's the most, they're miracles. Okay. And I do think the work of the workshops has raised the bar for everybody who's making a print. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at Stanley William Hayter's prints, and we have one at the Riz Museum, I know, and it has fingerprints on the margins, and the curator bought it in 1947 when it was new. So everybody thought it was fine. Oh, no. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody thinks it's cute to have fingerprints on the margins if you're going to put your prints out in the world now, because of, I think, that standard of craft. Yeah. And then from the other end, of course, um, I spend a lot of my time dealing with 19-year-olds, and... You know, I have a drawing class where um, we make our ink out of iron oak galls and draw with quill pens and do silver point and make chalks and things. And I'm always kind of surprised, but there's never any resistance to it. There's just this kind of eagerness to learn these mm. things. Mm. And because I think, you know, being in an art school where part of the whole ethos is a kind of freedom, I know that they're not going to get bogged down by those things, but they'll actually f find ways to use them that will surprise me. So. Um, I'm pretty, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's just the way artists use, use those things. If I could just make one comment about that. Yeah. I think as experimental as some of the projects are, and even back to conceptual art, it was all about how it was crafted, how it delivers the idea. And you can't do it with sloppy technique or no technique. Uh, even if you order up something uh, from a shop, you want it to be perfectly fabricated. Mm. And I do have to do that now. We did these project with Teresita Fernandez with water jet cutters, which I saw you have here at your school. Mm. And we have to farm that out and find somebody that will have that value of craftsmanship to execute that cut at mm. a level for an artwork, which would not be necessarily what that um, artisan or that um, man would do, that metal cutter would do uh, for another kind of yeah. commercial project. Well, well, these are pretty uh, decisive questions we are touching now. Uh, I remember the first videos when they showed up, they had to be bad as not to be, you know, connected with professional film mm -hmm. stuff, you know, but yeah, that has changed <laughs> dramatically over the years, luckily, because they were very boring, the first years of a video, here in, in Scandinavia, anyway. But, uh, but what are, what are you, your opinions about this? I mean, the problems, if you get too crafty... But is it really that relevant to printmaking? Because I, can, I know that there's anxiety about this in ceramics and glass, mm -hmm. furniture making, okay. but I don't really see that it's, that it's that much of a printmaking issue. All right. Could you it, explain that a little bit more? I mean, I'm well, just an art historian. All, First of all, I think that a lot of the, um, the, what we would consider the fine crafting of prints is actually ultimately gets hidden. It's, it's, it's not um, foregrounded mm -hmm. because it's just, it's just what makes the art reveal itself. Yeah. And I think that we sort of look through it. So we have that possibility. I mean, but I would, I would add that I do believe it's the artisan printmaker, the craftsman, that it contributes to the success to, of, of the artwork. You know, Eva could not make the plate that she, mm -hmm. uh, she, she made a drawing, they made the plate, they printed the plate, and then she collaged it onto the, onto the uh, sculpture. But she couldn't actually execute the quality. She couldn't print a plate the way 
my top printers can print. Right. And you would think, you know, look, think of Picasso. Uh, all of you curators know this. You, you, we, we value Cromwellink. We, we know that the people who are connoisseurs of prints recognize that Picasso's top printer was Cromwellink. And we know there's a sort of quality to the, to the print that for those who are uh, ab able to observe that and understand that, value. So the craftsmanship is absolutely, I would argue, critical to the printmaking process. Even if the artists themselves don't have that craft, the printer artisan must have it to make a successful collaborative project. Mm -hmm. Well, do you have a comment to that? Uh, this is a very normal notion, I think. Uh, well, I, I print all my own editions. Yeah. I'm not going to let anybody touch my copper plate. <laughs> but I'm not, I can't, I'm not that good at printing other people's things. No. But I have found a way yeah. to do my own things. Right. You know, and they, I think I do it the very best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I like doing it. But you know, I rely on, when I'm ready to do an edition, I call up Twin Rocker. Yeah. and talk to the paper maker, mm -hmm. and he sends me a sheet, and I print on it, and I say, I'm getting some white spots. He takes, sends me a sheet with less sizing. You know, it's those, those kinds of things. Yeah. And I think there, that's always embedded in projects, like making those choices and, and figuring those things out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Paper choice is a huge issue. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a major discipline, you it might is. say. And uh, so we, yesterday we had an artist working w with, you know, a tree paper made from... Oh trees, but you have many different traditions, the Japanese, etc. So it's, it's it's an art, you might say, just making paper. In Japan, certainly they have special artists just doing paper. At the Brodsky at Rutgers, that's one of the uh, processes that they are extremely good at, is paper making. Yeah. And so artists have come in to collaborate just with mm. the paper maker, like Linda Bangless working to make paper sculptures mm -hmm. out of pulp. Okay. Any questions from the audience here uh, about this? We have one. Uh, and just say your name, please, first. Michael Kirk. <coughs> Where I work, uh, health and safety is a huge factor. Can you speak it, up a little bit, please? Health and safety is a huge factor. And I noticed you, you started off with the Rauschenberg cyanotypes, and we're watching Christian Markley play in this pool of blue or in this room. I noticed there were some projects where everyone was wearing masks. Um, you work at a state university, <laughs> all right? Yes. I work under rules of EPA, constantly being told no, maybe, <laughs> no, and sustainability, and where does the waste go? And I, I think in many ways the, the idea of total freedom in part has, you know, when someone asks me, can I do that? Well, not here, but maybe someplace else. Mm. Uh, how much, and I'm watching Andrew make plates, and I know I've been exploring the idea of an all green applique for transfer onto plates. Uh, I know how toxic pigment can be. Uh, so I'm wondering, is, is your practices, your ability to make things being affected by that? Or is it becoming a factor as we talk about the expanded field? So that's just my question. So good question. Well, I'm going to use whatever I need to make my work. And then I'm going to wear a respirator or whatever I have to do. So um, Paul, um, Scott has helped me to figure out how to get that engraving onto the plate. And it involves using um, number seven litho varnish. Now we're getting to be a techie, technique -y thing. Um, it, and Paul told me about this stuff called potter's tar. We found out it's this pitch pine called Stockholm tar. And then Larry told me that I needed some lead tetroxide in there as a flexing agent. And we've got to use it. It's the secret ingredient. So we do use it. I think, I think it's actually important, um, even as we train our students, to train them to actually really use the methods that are being used out there safely, rather than um, sort of empty it out and, and have them just not be using the things that they need to learn. Mm -hmm. 
Should they be forbidden? Is that what you think? <laughs> no, you know, the question, should you go to water-based inks, et cetera? Yeah, um, Chinese, Japanese um, tradition. Yeah. I will say in China, they were using kerosene to uh, <laughs> clean their plates. We wouldn't do that. Um, do I get in trouble with the fire marshal? Sometimes. Do the safety people come by and worry where we've got our hazardous chemicals? Uh, yes. But um, the worst thing we've done is clog up the entire plumbing in the building, uh, washing <laughs> out um, plates. But now we have a good filter system for that. Yes, we're very safety conscious, and sometimes I'll, the uh, printers, for when they're working with certain um, inks and uh, actually on the Rocher Four Edge books, it's a lacquer that they're spraying. They dress in an entire suit, a paper suit with a respirator in a, a very uh, specific space. And um, I guess one of the most caustic things for us is the silk screen process. Uh, and I wish I had my own studio for that uh, because of the, of the fumes. Mm. So yes, we're very conscious of, of, that, of the uh, safety issues, but we try not to let that limit what we might do. We just find a way to do it in a, in a way that doesn't harm the artist or the printers. I mean, I think one of the most important safety issues has to do with repetitive, repetitive motion. Um, you know, you, those giant rollers. Oh, yeah. Sit, for me, sitting up straight while I'm engraving, remembering that we do art with our bodies as well as with our minds and our eyes and sort of thinking about how we're treating our bodies and oh, having those mats on the floor so we're not on those cement floors and all those things that I think are extremely important for a lifetime of work. You can really mm. get great workout. <laughs> if you do it right. <laughs> okay, but uh, I, I would uh, think maybe uh, in a studio, you know, where you have different uh, professional people together, that it's uh, a better place for discussing, let's say, uh, environmental problems, you know, and uh, general things. So my idea of a real print studio would be with a lot of people coming in, giving their opinions and coming with advice, you know theoreticians as well. Okay. Uh, I'm, well, I'm Theodore Bart. I want to address a question to Andrew, uh, whether uh, the uh, environmental issues that we're discussing at this point might be in, uh, sort of um, part of a broader question of the quality of reflection in artistic practice, uh, and that uh, um, when we've discussing the necessity to rewrite the history of, of graphics, uh, for me, it's interesting to see that the form of the result and the form of your process are kind of very pervasively uh, interlinked. Uh, you talk about body postures, but the entire process contains a nar narrative of making that kind of opposes the commercial society that you want to critique and establishing a kind of different prehistory or a con uh, contesting prehistory of what, uh, you know, the society of which you're critical somehow. So for me, it's kind of as though uh, especially in the um, the garden cycle, uh, in your, your your mother, I mean the the the, uh, the twelve plates from your the, your work, your mother's garden, kind of is the epitome of that because uh, the uh, the form of your uh, the the process kind of projected directly into to the results somehow, and so I, I was wondering about that idea of reproduction and reflection in artwork, is a kind of um, uh, proposal for a different way of of uh, understanding and, and telling about uh, 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 printing practices, uh, as it were. Not necessarily through speech, but actually through, uh, through the work process itself. Well, I certainly see a parallel between making that garden and working on those plates, and the kind of growth of the project and the um, that the cycle that I go through every year to develop that garden. I have thought, um, though, about your question to the panel before on the um, alternative history of prints. And because, because um, I spend a lot of time working in museums, and of course you do, and I think you know as you, and you do, I mean, and you know as you go through those boxes, the, the most amazing thing is to pick out a box. And you look at it, and there might be a Rauschenberg in there, but there are probably so many artists that you've just heard of or barely know, mm. and, and they, they have, those works still have so much to say. And I do think that alternative history is, is about that 
That's a good point. You know, there's those artists who are not famous, and I think it's something that happens working in museums. I work at the RISD Museum and um, as a faculty member, and I've gone through all the boxes, and I did inventory twice when we moved. And it was just, just to look at that panoply of artists, you could never get to the bottom of it. You could never know them all, which is a wonderful um, arena of knowledge. Where, and I think that's, that, you know, that print that hangs over my bed that speaks to me. Um, <laughs> he didn't know in 1630 when he made it that somebody was actually going to be so inspired by it in Providence, Rhode Island, which he probably didn't even know existed. So, I don't know. Hmm. I think that's, you okay. know, in response to one of your earlier questions. Yeah. You know, when you described uh, your relation to prints, old prints especially, uh, as an art historian, I felt immediately, you know, we're on the same level there, you know, we, uh, we are just... Uh, uh, Callot, Jacques Callot is one of my favorites. You know, he uses the line in such a brilliant way. Um, probably as you like as well. But the difference is that, you know, we're just standing there with an awe, oh, and there's an oh, awe, wow, how is it possible? And we write books and da 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 and essays. But I mean, you, you, you are making an imprint. You are doing something about what you see and what you enjoy and what you really, so. But working for eight years with Emily Peters and Jan Howard at the RISD Museum was like a tutorial to get a master's mm. degree, to see their insights and to see Jan's professionalism um, and just identifying certain things about contemporary art and photography and then um, to see how that PhD training that Emily has is, a, is applied to real things but then it's able to be used to pick apart ideas. Mm. And then I feel that um, as an artist, I have a contribution to make to the, hist to the history yeah. of prints. And that's what I think um, this whole, I, I, I think when we think about the art world, um, so often we think about it's a pyramid where some people are on top <laughs> and they feel good and then the people in the lower parts of the pyramid feel sort of <laughs> oppressed. <laughs> and I think that's a terrible way to think about it. I think um, one has, we have to think about it as a kind of ecosystem, especially when we're in a part of the art world that's so fragile like prints. Yeah. You know, where um, we're not part of the giant stratified power structure of giant mm. galleries and all that stuff. We're really trying to do something with those 99% things um, to, to um, reinterpret them for the world and keep them going and to keep new art mm. coming out, um, to make art available to people who can't go to um, Christie's and put up that paddle, but really would love to have something. Mm, yeah. And I mean, if you look at uh, his the museums all over the world, I mean, the print collections, they count, you know, tens and hundred thousands, you right. know, while the paintings are few and way up there, you know. So, so there, is a, there is a collective dimension in print that I like a lot that you just mentioned here, and many Many graphic artists and printers, they've been, you know, uh, heavily into this. So uh, we had talked a little bit about it yesterday, you know, we had um, uh, part of the thing. But the question is, I would like to ask you, if you have, I mean, so strong feelings, let's say for refinement, you know, in what you do, uh, like your uh, wonderful objects that we just passed around, I see you had a very limited edition. Why don't you want to beautify America? Well, it, because, it's because I mean, to get to the economic thing, <laughs> yeah. I'm paying for that myself out of my salary. Like, I, I save money to do that. And that's about the limit that I can afford. I mean, it's, it's going out on a limb. But the other thing is, as I've said a couple of times, 100 pieces of paper is about this big, but 100 objects fill 10 boxes. And so there's this, it's, it's been a fascinating expansion of scale mm, in so many ways. Yeah. I think 100 is a lot. I do too. And um, who knows what could happen? I mean, I, yeah. I would love to have the opportunity if I had the freedom to work with industrial production, maybe. Yeah. As long as nobody was, but I don't want anybody telling me what to do. So uh, excuse me, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I love about my Potter friend. Yeah. He says, okay, go ahead. Uh, he knows yeah. it's not going to happen, or th that maybe it will happen, or it may take a year longer than I thought mm, it would. But. Okay. Well, you know, production routines change. 
and uh, I think uh, this will be possible in your time. You're a lot younger than I am. So I think you should just look ahead and change America. Why not? <laughs> Go for it. What, what do the Americans say? In it to win it. That's the uh, idea there. But, uh, okay, uh, do you have opinions on this, you know, how to reach uh, a broader audience, public, with uh, art, you know? The print has a special role, or what, how do you look upon this? Or the, the way of thinking print, you know, it's, it is, uh, as we've said, it's very close to a collective way of producing and thinking. Is there hope for America? I mean... I don't, I miss the Republican debate, so I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that second debate, so I, I'm not um, completely able to say, but. I mean, the, the, the I'm question not sure is. I'm quite like where this. to start with your question. Will, will, will you just have small enclaves of connoisseurship and interesting artistic productions going on? And that's about it. You know, that's about reality now, mm. you know? Or is there a possibility like the real American uh, art movement, pop art, you know? They try to expand dimensions. Maybe some say it's vulgar, but I mean, it's an interesting experiment. Mm -hmm. And how far did they reach, you know? Well, they would reach Norway, certainly, but... Uh, but I, I mean, think about the, the ongoing relevance of that imagery. Mm. I mean, Andy Warhol is probably one of the best known artists yeah. now in the world. So I, I think, of course, I mean, the democratic possibilities of printmaking, it's something I briefly touched on, but I, I think it's built into the DNA. You know, the possibility of multiplicity, the possibility of reproduction, you know, it, it offers incredible, it has the potential for incredible things in the world. Yeah. And very often when artists um, do, you know, different kinds of public projects, whether it's a broadside for a city bus or, some sort of kind of insertion in a newspaper. It takes a printed form. Yeah. So. Maybe you, it would be interesting if you described the uh, Museum of Modern Arts, um, how the print department is not now so isolated that prints are moving into exhibitions uh, more broadly, and you're bringing other kinds of work into the print space. Do you like that? I love it. You do? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just so I know where, what kind of ground I'm on before I start. <laughs> we do know it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, so what Margaret's referring to is the fact that the, the Museum of Modern Art was founded in 1929. And from its very beginning, it's all, always had medium-specific, we call them now, silos. You know how the, certain terms just kind of find their way into the dialogue and suddenly you say it all the time? Deep dive about the silos. You could do like a whole... Anyway, so these medium-specific silos have existed since 1929. There's one for painting and sculpture. There was one for photography, one for film. Alfred Barr always wanted to have one for television, but he never was able to do that. Wouldn't that have been radical? Even now, it would be amazing and radical. Um, and something that I think is happening now, which is the result of a new generation of curators and leaders in the museum, is a recognition that while the silos serve a certain kind of purpose. For one, they allow multiple people to be the boss. There's a boss of painting and sculpture <laughs> and a boss of photography. You can have multiple bosses. The, the, the great downside to that is it doesn't acknowledge the way most artists actually work, which is yes. not in a siloed fashion. Um, I just did an exhibition on a, a short period in the career of the artist Jean Dubuffet when he essentially invents assemblage the exhibition included his illustrated books. It included prints, drawings, sculpture, and painting. And the story that I tried to tell in that exhibition was, in fact, what led that charge, the creation of assemblage, was, in fact, the experiments that he was doing in the print shop. He was making these lithographs, cutting them up, reassembling them, printing them again as these seamless compositions. And he realized in this way he could create these things that looked as though they had kind of sprung up fully formed, and it's that that lends itself next to sculpture and to his tableau d'assemblage, to his paintings also. So this willingness to let go of this siloed structure means that now when we're showing a Kirchner painting, we may be showing alongside that Kirchner painting the first Brooke portfolio, 
So rather than leaving the suite of chronological galleries and going downstairs to a print gallery where you might see German expressionist prints in all of their glory, you're able to see them in a, in a better, more full context right. that allows you to see the kind of multifaceted activities of those artists in that moment. And it's something that we're really um, driving towards in every iteration of those gallery installations. We're really trying to stay a little bit more true um, to the way that we understand artists to practice, while also making sure that all of the mediums are represented. Hmm. And I think that speaks to your question yeah. about um, how is our prints disseminated. Um, and and they, instead of, I think people would skip the print department mm -hmm. and not go into those galleries, but now the prints are put right out next to a painting or a sculpture or yeah. show mm -hmm. the more full scope of an artist's mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. The reason, Margaret, I asked if you like that or not is because there's been a lot of anxiety. I I've heard from a lot of people who are worried that this, um, this, this kind of exhibition-related integration means that we're going to abandon or neglect the print collection. And I have to reassure people that that really isn't the case. And in fact, prints are more prominent now at MoMA than they've ever been I think before. So. That's the best I've heard in a long time. Yes, Could you are. repeat that? <laughs> Which part? The Please. prints are. The, prints are, the print yeah. department is not uh, threatened. No. Well, not in Norway, at all. they have, you know, you have the print department stopped. Uh, where, uh, where is uh, Mayfried? Is she here? Yeah, when did it stop, you know, in the normal way? It's functioning still, I know, but it's not in the old way. Huh? Ten years ago. Ten years ago, yeah. yeah. Then they. Then it was part of, you know, they had uh, no special committee buying, so it's... But you mm -hmm. are buying. We are buying at a, some people would say, a kind of frightening rate. And in fact, the Department for Prints and Drawings has more endowed funds than any other curatorial department at the museum. Yeah. So our, our potential to continue collecting at the rate which we have historically is tremendous. Yeah. Wow. That... Uh, we have a... So keep making friends. Yeah. Okay, no, but I mean, this is... Uh, there are some people... Now there are loads of people. Okay, come on. Get on. You have Those a microphone? Questions. Say your name. I already have it. Uh, <laughs> I'm Lynn Svensson. I'm from the graphics department, of course, second year. And I have a question about... Uh, you've been shown around this school, and this school is actually six schools beaten into one. So I think it's... Um, very fitting for a seminar of printing in the expanded field. Do you have any recommendations of uh, how to use this opportunity our, we students have in this school that is rather special? What was the question? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> speak a little bit louder. I'm oh, so sorry. Um, uh, this school is six schools into one and represents a lot of different departments. And uh, being a, a seminar about graphics in the expanded field, I think that being shown around these schools, do you have anything to recommend to us as students oh. to... Uh, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. well, you mean, how did we respond to the absolutely amazing facility that you have that <laughs> no other school in the world has this <laughs> set up? And if you can't make great art here... Mm. Um, I think what was missing is, it, are, have you just started up the term? Because there wasn't much to see. There wasn't no, any they've just work, started. They've work just started. on display. So uh, oh. it's hard to make a recommendation having seen. Uh, would I like to see the work that you're producing? Yes, very much. But there wasn't that opportunity. Hmm. So all I can do is comment to you that if you don't know it, you have the most amazing facility for your practice. I think Jan would like to say something. Yeah. Hmm? That's your we time. We have time. Is that all? Yeah. Oh, this is so interesting. <laughs> but just to, uh, okay, um, just to answer you, I think Jan's policy is to try to collaborate with the other departments. You're doing something with ceramics, you know, in your field of. Yeah. Uh, and I heard Victoria talking yeah, about. Yeah, and uh, so that, I think that that would like be a, an important way of opening up, sort of, towards the academy, towards the the. Seeing the fog and uh, all these things will be interesting, and that's uh, that's the exciting melting pot. Yeah, don't of the exist in silos. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, silos are bad. <laughs> don't don't stick to your press. 
Okay. Uh, uh, Is there another? We're, uh, okay, one more question then. Yeah. Good. Say your name. Hi. Uh, good, uh, good morning. I'm Margarita González. I'm coming from Spain. I'm a publisher. And so my question regarding silos and this tendency of opening the gates could be uh, related to the market since the uh, art market is important for publishing big time. And I would like to know your ideas on the tendency of having a specialized art first for prints or the role of prints or contemporary printmaking or print projects in contemporary art first. Thinking on the situation on Freeze, Art Basel, Miami, Art Basel, Basel. Uh, so I would like if, if you could share your thoughts <coughs> of, of that. This is a very interesting debate that goes on uh, regularly in my studio, uh, particularly the salesperson. We participate in the International Fine Art Print Dealers Association, IFPDA. And to be a member of that, there's this big show that opens in November, as Sarah mentioned, with uh, print dealers and publishers showing uh, together. We then repeat that in other other cities. Uh, during Art Basel Miami, we have a print fair that's in a hotel on Collins Avenue. On the other hand, many of the publishers are now going into the main fair if they can get in. Of course, the cost is tremendous to participate there or are wanting to have their print shown in the broader context. You know there's, what, 16 or 18 parallel fairs during Art Basel, so you could go into Art Miami or Scope or uh, uh, one of the other fairs. And I would say many of the publishers and uh, print dealers uh, want to be in that context rather than isolated in just the print context. On the other hand, may I say, depending on the work that you're producing, and, and particularly if it's editions, there's a certain uh, group of collectors that are very uh, committed to prints. And when you're in the broader fair, people come by, they don't know anything about printmaking, they, they, they don't understand what the processes are, and so then they're gonna respond to, oh, Christian Markley, that's a, that's a work that I can afford, uh, that's a unique, and, and, and so that's why it's consumed. So I think there's an argument for both in terms of, of, of context. No, I don't have advice for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was that all right? Well, uh, we have to uh, round up uh, this. Uh, as a moderator, I'm very humble to have such a beautiful team to <laughs> talk to Walter. and listen to. And I think that is uh, everybody here has understood the message. So let's have a big hand for you. Thank you. No, no, please just be seated, just yeah. be seated. Now, as everybody knows, this has been a, a big event uh, at this uh, academy in Oslo. So uh, there's one person who especially had a lot to do to prepare and to talk to everybody. I mean, imagine the telephone numbers, etc., etc., to make this magnificent uh, seminar on printmaking in the expanded field. And we've talked about really so many different topics, you know, within the field. So I think uh, the future, as you said, uh, Sara, too, is rather good for the print field, okay? I look upon it uh, in this way. But Jan, would you please stand up and we'll give you a big applause. <laughs> wow. I must come with a correction. You are number one in the applause. So you, you're now number two. Okay. <laughs> That's quite appropriate. Okay. Uh, I will ask everybody to stand up. This is part very special uh, school you know I can just say it's a bit crazy too like the ceramic departments they have gas ovens 
Imagine the pollution. <laughs> Gas ovens that are so big that you have to go to China to find you know, something like it. And this is an art school. Uh, it's just incredible. So look forward to that. Okay, the closing of the seminar at 7 o'clock this evening with drinks and buffet in the reception area, okay? That's for everybody with a badge, all right? Um, the following openings are taking place at this school this evening. You have Hot Week, that's for the students uh, and the teachers at the metal department. They're doing very interesting things, corpus and jewelry. Uh, it's at uh, 5.30 in the gallery at Seilduken, which is uh, outside of the building to the left a little bit. It's one and a half minute away, and it's on the second floor. And there's another exhibition, Maria Halberg and Sanna Hanyos opening Rising Horizons, and that is in the first floor in the same Seilduken gallery. Okay, and that's at 18.30, okay? And at, sorry? It's at six, it says here 18.30, but it's 8, okay, sorry. 18, oh, 6 o'clock. Performance. Performance. Okay. Good. And at 19, uh, 7 o'clock, there is an opening at the Skylight Gallery. Just ask in the reception, they will show you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice, we've had a nice seminar. Excuse me?